What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Data Dash and today is September 17th of 2021. Well folks, I hope you are having a fantastic day wherever you are and in today's video, I wanna dive into the conversation around the decreasing supply of available cryptocurrencies in the overall crypto market, therefore playing into the benefit of price going into the next couple of months. And again, this is solidifying further why we believe that as we're going up in price once again, that we just experienced a mid-cycle correction back in May and are on pace to revisit all-time highs by the end of this year, as well as make new all-time highs going into 2022. And outside of that as well, we've got a sponsored segment on Radix and their recent token unlock. So stay tuned for that. You guys won't want to miss it. Okay, let's go ahead and dive into this conversation, guys. I want to dive not only into the price analysis here, which I think is generally showing us here what we've talked about a lot on the channel, which is that when there is a positive net flow of capital into the market, we see those higher lows and higher highs, right? You can start to see that after you make these nice solid ranges of support, the next step we wanna see are those higher ranges of highs, higher lows, higher ranges, right? You can see there's a lot of these higher lows and higher highs that we're settling up here, right? Now, what we wanna do after the sell-off we saw back here in September, this little pullback that we had in the market after we yet again solidified support, just like we did back here throughout May, June, and July, right? Over a course of three months here, what we wanna see is again, multiple retests on this line. So again, whether we get price dipping back down here, we've already got a couple here, but it could be very likely that we come down here and zigzag as we talked about in one of our previous videos where price just generally pushes sideways for a little while, builds that new foundation, and I'll kind of drag it down here again against the support line, and then we start to really set in, again, as we've seen here, those higher lows and higher highs, right? Seeing price go up, down, up, down, right? The highs are getting higher, the lows are getting lower. Apologies for my drawing skills. This is why I, I prefer to keep things limited when it comes to drawings on TA. So that's the general thesis here, what we wanna see in price. But to actually kind of circumvent our estimations for price and rather look at the actual on-chain metrics, putting aside our biases, or our biases, right? Let's go ahead and just take a look at what's going on. Because we understand that what drives these general higher lows and higher highs or vice versa, lower lows and lower highs, in signaling in this case a bearish trend, is generally about the inflows and outflows of markets. Is there more capital coming into an asset class like cryptocurrency, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, or is there more liquidity flowing out? And I can't express it to you guys. You know, there's so many people tell you, use this indicator. There's this event that happened in crypto markets. It's the end all be all for crypto. Guys, this is the cold hard truth that people either don't understand or don't want to tell you because it's a relatively simple principle. Markets are solely determined, practically entirely determined by inflows and outflows, right? And it doesn't matter if that indicator you really like is signaling that, oh, the momentum's start, starting to die down or, oh, this news headline says that crypto's over. Whether those contribute beneficially or negatively towards crypto markets is negligible in the grand scheme of things. What really matters is are more people market buying cryptocurrencies or market selling, putting pressure on one direction of the order book that determines the price of any given asset, right? So let's go ahead and talk about some of these. First thing here I wanna talk about is a new headline coming out of Cointelegraph, and we got a similar one here for Bitcoin. But $1.2 billion in Ether withdrawn from centralized exchanges in a record daily outflow. Now, I wanna be very candid on this, guys. Uh, this is a news metric that came out of Into the Block, which is a cool company in the crypto space. They're one of the many different data science providers or data analytics providers within the crypto space. And they had registered, in this case, a $1.24 billion outflow of exchanges, the biggest we've seen in all of 2021. Now, I wanna be very um, you know, candid in this case and not jump too much to conclusions because as I'm looking across some of the other data science uh, providers, in this case, your data analytics providers, what we're seeing here is not similar to what in the block is reporting here in the sense of this dramatic subtraction, right? And again, I'm not here to, to just like you know, say, oh, FOMO, the market's great. Look at this positive news. Oh, the data's faulty. Oh, whatever. We, we that, you know, that was 48 hours ago and stuff, right? I want to be genuine with you guys in saying that, look, I don't know if that drop is real or not because we're not seeing it across a lot of the other ones. I'm looking at Glassnode, for example. And, and all these providers, they usually pull the data in different ways and they might pull from different exchanges in this case, right? 
But when I look at Glass and a lot of other providers, I don't see that. And I really don't care about one daily app flow. I know a billion dollars sounds like a great benefit to Ethereum, and it would be um, you know, coming out of exchanges. But I want to focus on just the broader trend here. What's been happening since as far back as August of 2020, over a year ago? Well, we've been seeing here outside of a general, uh, a general increase in the supply of Ethereum on exchanges back a couple years ago during the bear market, right? We can see here that we've now been seeing a decline in the amount of Ethereum from 20% down here to 12.9%. Now, what's really great about this is that in the broader trend, we can see that it is in our favor here. We are seeing supply contraction here. And this is generally beneficial for price, especially when you're in an environment where whether people want to debate it or not, demand for Ethereum is picking up big time especially as we're seeing a lot of this ETH go towards the ETH 2.0 staking contract. People want the yields. They want to be able to hold an asset that has generally been outpacing the vast majority of index indices in traditional markets or generally any other asset class out there. And they want to have something that's going to pay them that, you know, percentage APY on their ETH while they're just holding it long term. And this, whether people like to admit it or not, is going to dramatically reduce the amount of Ethereum that can be market sold on the order book. It is an absolutely beneficial factor for price. And whether or not that fades eventually once those Ethereum tokens or Ether are made available, right? Eventually when ETH2 launches, yeah, perhaps that could be a negative ramification. For now though, it is a clear supply and demand change in this case. It has positive ramifications on price. Now, outside of this as well, you've also got features like EIP-1559, right, which have been burning tons of Ethereum in this case, continuing to, again, further reduce that supply, right? Now, even though there are new mined um, Ethereum in this case still is until we get to ETH 2.0, this is, again, a positive ramification on supply. And as demand has been relatively heightened, it's starting to showcase here that with these supply reductions, price can continue moving higher. It's not just me saying that to be completely candid, guys. We can just take a look at ETHUSD, right? The ETHUSD chart here is showing us strong base holding up the vast majority of gains here, right? And from there, we've come back up, set those higher lows and higher highs, and are pressing back up to where we were back near May, just a couple hundred bucks away, right? So again, this is the kind of stuff you want to see when you're looking at assets you want to expose yourself to. Now you want to look for confident assets sitting in those higher lows and higher highs. And we get another one here, and again, I don't want to, again, just use headlines to cause um, fodder or FOMO or anything, but I think it's a, it's a good thing to kind of showcase here that there are some big moves going on on both the Bitcoin and Ethereum network, and it's the billion dollar plus moves that we're seeing on both Bitcoin and Ethereum. And whether that's, again, in this case, people making transfers, exchanges moving from one wallet to another, or in this case, what we've seen a lot, as a lot of institutional players have gotten in some larger spot orders, whether it be the corporate treasures, etc. We're starting to see, again, like we saw in the Ethereum chart, a reduction in the amount of Bitcoin supply on exchanges. So this is a transaction, an unknown wallet in this case, so not really what appears to be exchange wallet registered a $2 billion transaction. And the really cool thing is because Bitcoin is not seeing too heavy of transaction volume right now. It's around 78 cents here that they'd had to spend in order to send $2 billion. I can tell you guys there is nowhere on the planet that you would be able to send that much locked up value from one party to another. And maybe you guys might say, oh, you know, maybe there is some, some other crypto network. But you get my, my point here in the sense of traditional payment networks and also a network that actually has that much value in it, being able to send $2 billion. It's absolutely incredible. Now, again, getting to the actual data here, I want to make sure my webcam is not in the way. You guys know I have a problem with that sometimes, so I'll go ahead and drag this down here. This is the percentage of Bitcoin supply on exchanges, and whereas over the past couple of years, right, we've seen here that that metric had continued to climb higher and higher and higher as we've talked about, the market dynamics are starting to change. And that is that we're seeing a reduction of the amount of supply of Bitcoin on exchanges. From here, around 17% back in the peak of March of 2020, when there was peak fear, starting to get evaporated from exchanges and absorbed by private investors, by other different types of sources. And one thing to be completely fair, 
some of this Bitcoin is getting sucked up, unfortunately, in derivatives markets, which has contributed to the excess volatility we've been seeing in crypto, as there's less liquidity on the spot market. This leads to more dramatic upswings in price and also downswings. But as we see this general trend coming down, we have to factor that a lot of that supply reduction from exchanges is going to long-term holders. It's going to individuals who have a longer-term time preference. They're not trading. If you don't have the liquidity on the exchange, as we saw here, the growing number of liquidity, it likely means that people aren't looking to get in and out of the market so quick. They're looking to hold Bitcoin and hold it for the next 10 years. Companies like MicroStrategy, again, that are starting to absorb a large, amount, large amounts of that supply. So this is a really important metric to keep in mind, guys. And I understand, again, there's so much, you know, hubla in this case, so much noise out there in this space when it comes to crypto. And, you know, it can leave people feeling in this case like they're missing out or, you know, oh my gosh, I should have gotten out of the market, I should be getting in the market. Guys, if you maintain a long-term time preference, if you look at these key metrics here that give you everything you need to know, it's going to be smooth sailing in this case when it comes to crypto markets. And I can tell you guys, again, I'm more convicted on these types of trends rather than, oh, what's today's price in this case? Or where are we going to be in a week's time? Because my time preference isn't to look to take profits next week. I'm looking to take profits on the crypto market when we're in euphoric parabolic price territory. We're just not there. Plain and simple, guys. There's really no debating it here. Ethereum getting as close as it already is to its previous all-time highs. Bitcoin continuing to set in those higher lows and higher highs, eating up any kind of corrections at the market by setting in higher support, and then starting to, again, set in higher lows and higher highs. There's really no argument here. The data science models say it. Price is showcasing it. And I don't want to be exuberant in this case. I don't want to be overtly bullish. But there's nothing that really proves that that's happening, especially the important metrics here, which have to do with the available supply. I can tell you guys, and I'll say this quite confidently, you will see an increase in this case, a significant increase in the amount of Bitcoin on exchanges by the time we're getting towards those new all-time highs where the market's going to set at a peak and top out and officially start the beginning of the unfortunate but inevitable bear market. So anyways, guys, I want to keep it rational, neutral as always, keep you guys focused on the long-term vision. If you like this, go ahead and drop a like, but let's go ahead and dive in to the conversation around Radix and its new token unlock. Alrighty, everyone. So in today's sponsored review, we're going to be taking a look over a project that's a familiar name here on the channel. We just recently did an interview not too long ago with Pierce, who's one of the founders of the project, and it's no other than Radix or Radix DLT. Now, for those of you who have been familiar viewers here on the channel, you guys not only know that Radix is one of the interesting plays that I've been keeping my eye on over the last couple of months when it comes to emerging layer ones. But outside of that as well, Radix is aiming to do something quite noble, and it's in an area that I have a very high focus in. So before we dive into the exciting news, I just want to give a bit of context here about Radix and its backstory. Now, for those of you who don't know, Radix has been building throughout the depths of the bear market. They're really one of those time-tested projects that was working one of the most difficult times for crypto and is now finally bringing its vision to materialization. And that is no other than building an ecosystem that can truly incubate and build out a flourishing DeFi or decentralized finance ecosystem. You know, I love Ethereum at the end of the day. It's a great platform in many ways, and it is where the vast majority of DeFi is happening. But it'd be ignorant to say that there isn't a lot of issues on Ethereum, whether it's issues with solidity-based contracts leading to massive hacks, multi-million dollar hacks in the DeFi ecosystem, whether it's the sheer difficulty of having to learn an on-ramp into solidity and knowing all the nuances of it, or the usability issues within DeFi when it comes to utilizing Ethereum-based applications, the friction points that can happen when you're trying to use AMMs or different types of applications. So I want to go ahead and talk about how Radix is aiming to change this, to build a highly scalable blockchain that not only provides new frameworks like Scripto, its programming language that serves as an alternative to Solidity to make the building process 10x more efficient, but also along with this as well, bolstering security and making usability and the flourishing of different types of applications much easier. So there's all kinds of things. If you guys want to dive into that, I recommend you check out that interview or possibly dive into some of the papers or documents here on Radix. I always recommend you guys do your own due diligence. Don't just take my word for it. There is a ton of really exciting stuff out there. And a lot of it isn't too hard to digest in this case, right? 
But I want to talk a little bit about the Radix token unlock. Now, this is a very important thing to talk about when we're discussing DeFi uh, applications, if we're talking about layer one protocols, anything that actually has a token to it. And I'm not going to sit here today and tell you guys whether or not you should buy Radix or not. That's not my job. I'm not here to tell you guys to just go out and buy crypto or token. But understanding in this case, if you're considering investing in Radix or learning more about the protocol, getting engaged, and therefore probably being a token owner, you need to understand the supply schedule in this case. And we just spent some time today talking about that supply schedule when it comes to Ethereum and Bitcoin. It's under important to understand, especially with new projects, token unlocking. And the community recently decided in this case, there was a over 70% majority weight voting for the token holders of the existing circulating supply and for just general Radix holders on a person by person basis, I think around 50 to 60% voting in favor of unlocking the rest of the Radix token supply. And this is very important to understand, as we've now had this token unlock, it does change the dynamics of Radix. And whereas token unlocks in this case can be seen as a very bad event, in fact, it's actually played out quite well for Radix. And I think there's a reason why we're seeing a lot of the community supporting this decision, and therefore leading to the decision on September 15th, where the rest of the Radix supply has now entered into the circulating supply for Radix. So let's go ahead and talk about this. First off, there was a survey that was conducted from the community. Again, as we hinted on in this case earlier on the video, this was a very supported initiative from the existing circulating supply holders. And the reason I think why it was supported, as we'll see here, is that token unlocks aren't always terrible events, especially when you consider the fact that Radix, in this case, not only just launched mainnet, so there's a lot of excitement around the project, but outside of this as well, you've got staking incentives when it comes to Radix. So a lot of people who are long-term invested, whether they're early investors or people who have participated later on and bought on spot markets, a lot of them are participating in this case with a long-term vision. Radix is a very early project. It's a lower than $1 billion market cap when you're considering the new entrance of the rest of the existing circulant supply compared to Avalanche, Solana, so many projects that have really overinflated. And I'll be honest with you all, even though as we're talking about this momentum in layer one protocols, I don't know if it's entirely justified just yet. And I don't know if they have the best framework to really grow out further adoption of DeFi or build better applications than Ethereum. Right? In the case of Radix, I do know that they're definitely one of the emerging projects that meets that category and has a chance to take some of that market share or possibly service as a great ally alongside other layer one blockchains. But again, as we talked about the results here, there was overwhelming support for it. So let's just go ahead and talk about token unlocking here. You know, again, as it generally has a negative connotation, can it actually be a good thing? Well, let's take a look at one of the major plays that's right now, as we just talked about a moment ago, rallying throughout the market and defining the competitive layer one scene. And that's Solana, right? Solana in this case, had its token unlock back in January of 2021, right? And during that time period, this really led to a massive influx of available Solana, right? Now, again, the thing that people always worry about in this case, and I, again, tell people to be wary of this, you really got to know who's investing behind the projects and what is the thesis for this project? Is it a long-term initiative that's actually worth sticking around with in the long term? That means that a lot of the token supply can hit the order books and it can start to impact price in this case if you have short-term investors. But what's really interesting is that as Solana had launched it out, this was back here in the chart here in January. You can see this was basically, you know, if anything, possibly a couple days of sell side price action. But afterwards, prices really started to move up because you know in this case, once you finally have had that token unlock scheduled event, you know in this case that there's no major uh, VCs in this case later down the line that are going to basically be selling or early stage investors, right? Now they can start to average out of their positions, right? But long story short, this has generally been a good event here for Solana. And we can see that it's a great example here in the long term. But again, it's important to understand if there's good staking mechanisms that incentivize to people to be long term on the project, or in this case, if you're going to have the issue of people just simply selling on the market and going on to another project. But I want to go ahead and take a look here at so far how it's impacted Radix. Now, again, I'm not here to do TA in the sense of telling you guys to go out and buy Radix. I want you guys to do your own due diligence, right? But I want to showcase here how we can see, obviously, the quick money makers in this case, people want to get out. They don't really care about Pierce and the team's vision in this case, right? They got out in this case, they sold. But what we can see here is that buyers come in eventually, 
And now prices are actually higher than where they were after the token unlock because they know that there's not this waiting and pending amount of supply that's going to come later down the line. And people are buying into this valuation because they believe in the project. In this case, they believe that the fundamental value creation is going to be much higher later down the line and therefore possibly market cap can keep rising. Right. So again, this is a really interesting thing to see here overall when it comes to the price action of Veronix. But long story short, guys, what I really want you guys to focus on here today is to simply focus in on what really matters, which is what Radix is building. And there's a ton of great documentation. Some of it can be a little bit overwhelming if you guys don't either have a large amount of time uh, to dive into it or just aren't, for example, very big on the technical side. But they have three major white papers here, one talking about the atomic cross shard consensus that they have that makes uh, the network so scalable. Along with that as well, their consensus theory on how the network actually reaches consensus for transactions, whether you're making a swap through an automated market maker or just simply sending Radix from one user to another. And then outside of that as well, the Radix economic paper that actually talks about the economics of the network and how in this case, again, as we're talking about the supply and demand side of things for Radix, we have elements very similar to EIP-1559 on Radix that actually burn and make the currency deflationary when it's being utilized. So things like this really set it in a good position and can help offset, in this case, any concerns that you want someone might have, in this case, with token unlocks. So anyways, guys, I highly recommend you guys check into it, possibly look into the staking and burning mechanisms of Radix and look into the vision in this case that you can find a lot of things in regards to the knowledge base of the technical documentation that can help to break things down or the blog as well as a great resource rather than having to dive through the intensity of the white paper. I would only say to dive through the white papers if you guys are really interested off of the surface level content on the blog and the documentation. Anyways, that's it for today's video, guys. If you like this, drop a like. If you guys are fans of the Radix Network, feel free to leave it down below in the, uh, in the comments. In this case, let me know what your guys' thoughts are. But that being said, everyone, have a wonderful rest of your day, and I'll see you all in the next one. Take care, everyone.